As I'm recording this video near the end of 2019, the total number of confirmed exoplanets stands at 4,104. We've come a long way since the discovery of the first exoplanet orbiting a sun-like star back in 1995 with 51 Pegasi b, and the reality is that the race to find new exoplanets is only accelerating. New ground and space-based telescopes are turning up planetary candidates at an accelerating rate. New techniques will find planets in entirely new ways. The bottom line is that over the next few decades, this mere 4,000-ish will multiply by orders of magnitude. So let's run the clock forward and try to calculate what the future holds for exoplanets. How many worlds will we know about in three decades from now, in the year 2050? I'm basing this video on a new study that was released by Rene Heller from the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research and Laszlo L. Kiss from the Konkli Observatory in Hungary. Their paper is called Exoplanet Vision 2050, and this was based on a workshop that was recently held at the Konkoli Observatory. The goal of the paper was to chart the growth of planetary discoveries over the past 25 years, since 1995, and then chart this growth forward until 2050. If the power law of growth continues at the same pace, then the researchers estimate that we'll know of one hundred million planets by 2050. One hundred million other worlds. At which point we've got to ask the question, how will we find that many planets? Which observatories and techniques will add that many worlds to our galactic atlas? The idea of a power law is well known in the realm of technology, and the most familiar version of this has got to be Moore's Law. Intel co-founder Gordon Moore noticed that new manufacturing methods were increasing the density of transistors by roughly double every two years. Over time, this number improved to every 18 months, and it's been going strong for over 50 years. And it was this regular doubling of transistor density that has enabled the modern computer era. Double the density, and you can provide more computer power for lower price. Moore's Law has continued to guide the semiconductor industry as they develop new manufacturing methods and continue to increase transistor density. Engineers don't know how they're going to do it decades from now, they just assume they'll figure it out in the future, and then they make their predictions around it. In this paper, Heller and Kiss make the same assumption in exoplanetary discovery and attempt to make predictions about which missions and techniques will provide the new planets. They start by breaking up exoplanet research into eras, the major techniques that astronomers have used to find planets. The first era was the radial velocity era. This is the technique where astronomers carefully measure the light coming from a star and then calculate the Doppler shift of the light as the star is wobbled from the gravity of its planet, yanking it back and forth. In the case of 51 Pegasi b, astronomers measured a radial velocity of approximately 55 meters per second, which is the equivalent of about 200 kilometers per hour. In other words, as the planet orbits around the star, it can pull away or towards us at a speed of 200 kilometers per hour. There are now a total of 782 planets discovered using the radial velocity method, which requires the planet to be roughly in the same plane as Earth and its star, so its wobble can be measured. The second era in exoplanet discovery came with the development of the transit method. This is where astronomers watch the total amount of light coming from a star and then detect how it dims slightly as a planet passes in front. This is the most productive method of finding planets that we know of. So far, 3,135 exoplanets have been discovered using the transit method, with over half of them coming from NASA's Kepler satellite. It would have found many more, but the failure of its reaction wheels ended the mission early. The follow-on Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, should find over 10,000 planets on its own. And the mission just wrapped up its first year, completing its first survey of the Southern Hemisphere, and now it'll move to the Northern Skies and start all over again. How do we go from thousands to millions? The researchers don't speculate on the method that will be used, but they estimate when we'll know 
when we'll know. It takes about two decades for a mission to go from concept to launch. Plans for Plato were drawn up in 2005, and the mission is expected to launch in 2026. In other words, the missions that will launch in the late 2040s will be devised over the next decade or so. It might be that the next generation of planet hunters are just scaled up Tessas or Keplers using the transit method at an industrial scale. Imagine the James Webb version of Tess, able to find planets at a much greater distance, or multiple Keplers flying in formation to act like a single telescope with a much larger baseline. The problem is that this technique can only turn up planets that pass directly in front of their star from our perspective, and about only 1% of planetary systems are nicely aligned from our view. NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, or WFIRST, will also be a planet hunter, using gravitational microlensing to find other worlds. When two stars perfectly align, the foreground star acts like a lens, making the background star flare briefly. If the foreground star has planets nearby, these can cause additional spikes in the flare. 86 planets have already been discovered using this technique, but WFIRST will take this to the next level. It should detect many more worlds, including planets down to a tenth of the mass of the Earth. WFIRST will also be able to directly observe exoplanets, which are roughly the size of the planets in the solar system at ranges of 3 to 10 astronomical units away from their star. But there are other ground and space-based missions that will use this direct imaging technique to observe the light from exoplanets themselves no matter what their orbital inclination is. Giant telescopes like the European Extremely Large Telescope or NASA's HABEX mission will use coronagraphs to block the light from the star to observe Earth-sized planets orbiting sun-like stars. And we should start seeing the light from those mega telescopes in the mid-2020s and into the mid-2030s. And once again, we can expect even bigger versions to be proposed in the next decade, constructed and operational by 2050. Right now, only 47 planets have been discovered through direct imaging, but expect that number to go way, way up. Another technique that will deliver at least an order of magnitude more planets is called astrometry. This is a technique that watches the motion of stars in the sky over long periods of time and tracks how they carve out little circles as they orbit a common center of gravity with their planet. The advantage of this method is that the planets don't need to pass perfectly between us and the star. Instead, they can be seen at any angle, and face-on is ideal. At this point, only a single planet has ever been discovered using astrometry. And it's not exactly Earth-like. The star is a red dwarf located about 65 light years away with only 7.5% the mass of the Sun. Astronomers tracked the wobble of the star and calculated that it needs to have a planet with 28 times the mass of Jupiter and orbit its star every 246 days. This is an extreme, but this is how it always goes. Astronomers find the outliers, and then new technology and instruments find hundreds and then thousands more. And one of those instruments already in space is ESA's Gaia spacecraft, the most sensitive star tracking mission ever built. Now, we already did an in-depth video about the incredible discoveries it's already made as it tracks the position and motions of over a billion stars in the Milky Way. And it will do this so precisely that it'll be finding planets orbiting those stars by how they wobble as they orbit around the Milky Way. By the time it completes its mission several years from now, it's estimated that Gaia will detect tens of thousands of planets out to a range of 1,600 light years from Earth. Tens of thousands of planets as a side effect of an astrometry mission. Now we're on to something. In 2017, astronomers proposed launching an updated version of Gaia called Gaia Near with additional capabilities in the near infrared spectrum. This mission would use the knowledge from Gaia and could improve its findings by a factor of 20. In 2017, a team of scientists came together to propose a mission that might follow on to the successes of Gaia, and it's called Thea. This would be a medium-class mission that would launch as soon as 2029. And according to their proposal, this mission would reach the sub-micro arc-second level of precision, 
1,000 times better than Gaia for bright objects, and 30 times better for fainter stars. And it would help in the search for dark matter as well as discover Earth-like planets orbiting nearby stars. The next technological advancement would take astrometry to an even larger scale, flying multiple satellites in formation, giving them a baseline equivalent of 100 to 1000 meters across. And there are other techniques for finding planets like timing the radio signals from pulsars to discover planets orbiting around them. But seriously, who wants to live on one of those worlds? The reality, of course, is that we probably don't know what's going to deliver all the new planets over the next three decades. An existing method that gets perfected and scaled up, or a brand new method that delivers surprising discoveries. We just don't know. That's why they call it the future. I remember the discovery of the first exoplanet orbiting a sun-like star in 1995. Here's hoping I'm still around by 2050 when the 100 millionth exoplanet is announced when we know of thousands of Earth sized worlds orbiting sun like stars, and maybe just maybe the detection of life somewhere else out there in the Milky Way. What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Here are the names of the patrons who support us at the $10 level and more. Want to see your name here support the work we do? Go to patreon.com slash universe today. Once a week, I gather up all my space news into a single email newsletter, and send it out. It's got pictures, brief highlights about the story and links you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. And did you know that all of my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format? So you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search universe today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. I talked about the Gaia mission and its goal of measuring over a billion stars in the Milky Way. Here's an entire video we did about this space telescope, the science it's already delivered, and what comes next.